Okay, very special guest this morning, um, an Australian Test Cricket captain, he's played 96 tests for his country, three World Cups, um, his dad and a husband, um, ICC Hall of Fame, the Australian Sport Hall of Fame, um, and I've probably missed a fair bit out there, but Adam Gilchrist, thank you so much for joining us on the, uh, the Hale Sport podcast. Uh, pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Luke, and uh, gentlemen that I'm talking to here and to everyone watching or listening. Yeah, great, great to join you and um, great initiative in this uh, interesting time that we're all going through. Yeah, now, just by way of introduction, so I've got our head of PE, Kane Greenaway, uh, here, and then also our captain and vice-captain of our first 11 team, Matthew Sculthorpe and James Verko. So, um, Adam, what we'll do, if it's all right, I'll let the boys and, and, and Kane and I ask you some questions and uh, just a little bit about you, know, you, your career, and then a bit of advice you have for our boys that are starved at the moment. Yeah, sure, mate. Uh, far away. I'm just, just saying, uh, before we started recording, I've known... Kane for a while, a bit of background information for people. I've known Kane for a long while. He's uh, been really good mates with my brother-in-law. Um, known Maddie Sculthorpe, well worked, coached, supported his dad in coaching and helped him with his junior pathway development. And then um, James, uh, I know him from scoring when he was in the opposition and he's usually ripping my son's middle stump out of the ground. So there's a nice connection with three of the four on, on his throw, Luke. It's nice to, nice to see you too. Yeah. <laughs> all good, all good. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, Kane, go for it, mate. Yeah. Okay, Adam, you grew up obviously in New South Wales, um, and while everyone tracked your cricket career, can you tell us a bit more about some of the other sports you played growing up? Yeah, well, uh, pretty much everything. So, as you mentioned, New South Wales and, and regional New South Wales. So, very fortunate. Um, first of all, down in the Southern Riverina, so just just north of the Victorian border, in uh, a small place called Deniliquin. Um, yeah, but it was, we didn't want for anything by way of sporting facilities. We just had so much open space. Uh, we were fortunate we had, you know, nice big backyards out in the, in the country regions of New South Wales. And then all the, all the facilities you wanted, be it um, footy or cricket grounds or tennis courts. Um, so I just had a crack at all of it, really. Um, it, in summer, it was um, junior cricket in the morning and then go and try and try and scrounge around and get some sort of input into the senior game in the afternoon. It'd be, be 12th or 13th or 14th man for my, my family or my parents, dads or older siblings teams. Um, and then tennis on a, on a Sunday. Uh, winter was footy and soccer, Aussie rules it was down there, um, which a lot of people, given that I grew up in New South Wales, a lot of people are a bit surprised that I played more footy than I did rugby league. Um, I had one season of rugby league, but I worked out, I reckon there's a bit more skill in trying to get away from your opponent than running straight up and hitting them front on. But I, I know Hale is a very proud rugby school and, uh, and does very, very well. So uh, they're much tougher than me, the rugby boys. So I played footy um, and fancied around up in the forward line and just tried to poach a few, uh, a few goals uh, off the edge of the pack there. But um, yeah, pretty much had a crack at everything. But um, I remember... Once we were sitting in the change rooms in a rain delay in the Australian team and, and we all threw it around the change rooms about what was your best other, other sport. We all gathered that if we were in the Australian cricket team, cricket was probably what we would say is our best sport. But um, what was your best other? And so I, I would probably say soccer was my where I was most talented or had the most skill. Um, Ricky Ponting, golf, he, he's a scratch handicapper. He um, is amazing. Andrew Simon's rugby league, and it went round to Mark War, and he sat back and he went, uh, golf, soccer, tennis, league, union, and that's typical Mark War. He just he, no filter, doesn't know how to be discreet about anything. But he was pretty good at pretty much all those sports and represented Australia in a number of underage sports. So um, yeah, so just had a bit of a crack at everything, mate. Uh, Kane, I reckon that's pretty good development, even if you're specifically heading down one avenue of sport, try and vary the base level up because it helps your development across your whole body and, and mind um, to, to have a better foundation to, to then fine tune your skills from. Yeah, awesome. Um, following on from sort of the, the stories around uh, regional New South Wales where you grew up, um, you obviously made a few representative teams um, and then again at, at national level, um, 
sort of started to, to, to crack it. What sort of made you move to WA and, and can you tell us a bit more about that story and what it was like to shift away from your support network and, and really establish yourself as, as a West Aussie that we'll all claim now, so. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess, um, guess growing up and, and even getting into my sort of senior career in New South Wales, I never, I never really ever stopped to think that you'd leave your home state I had to obviously leave home to go to Sydney. Um, I went to Adelaide for a year at the Cricket Academy, which was an amazing experience. But then I obviously had to leave the regional rural area to go and pursue my cricketing dreams. I had to move to a, a major city and Sydney was the simple move at that time. Um, but I never thought I'd leave there. For a few years, there was rumours that other states were looking to poach me, but it, it never happened. And then eventually, having played a little bit for New South Wales. Um, uh, I had an approach from Western Australia to come over. No guarantees, just to join the squad. And a guy by the name of Tim Zura was the, the, the wicketkeeper batsman, had been for 10, 12, 15 years. Been an amazing servant to WA cricket. But they knew that, I think they knew that he was closer to the end of his career than the start. So they looked around and uh, I was given the opportunity. Uh, pretty much... The main thing I recall is thinking, right, I'm going to go and give this a crack. I'm going to go wholeheartedly and commit to it. I was amazed at how many people said, oh, will you move over for six months of the summer and then move back home and then sort of go back and forward? And that didn't even enter my mind. I thought if, I'm, if you're moving and you're going to try and take something on, just commit wholeheartedly to it. So um, came over. Uh, I was nervous at the time. Very nervous that Tim Zura had been such a wonderful player for Western Australia. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they sacked him and put me straight in. Um, unbeknownst to me, this was all happening. And all of a sudden, I'm getting a debut for Western Australia in, uh, at the Wacker, getting booed onto the ground by the locals uh, and the members and everyone because they didn't know who this young bloke from New South Wales was. They just knew that they'd had Tim Zura for however many years, over a decade, being brilliant. So it was at that point where I guess I just made one decision that I didn't need to be Tim Zura. I was never going to be able to, you know, replicate everything he did because I was a different body shape and different skill level. And, um, and I was at the start of my career. He sort of had a lot of experience. So I guess all I tried to do was work out, okay, what, what was it that he did so well try and pick pieces out of it that I could work on and aspire to be, but just just be the best I could be. Don't try to be him. Try to replicate a lot of the things that he was doing. Um, and then that helped down the track too later on in, in trying to get into the Australian team when Ian Healy was left out uh, at my expense. And, um, and again, I, I couldn't try. I didn't have to be Ian Healy. I just needed to be, be the best I could be. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so several great seasons for WA in the mid-90s saw you debut for Australia in one dayers in 96. You spent most of the next three years establishing yourself in that team before you were selected to make your test debut against Pakistan at the Gabba in 99. Can you tell those listening about the cap presentation and Emery, any memories from that first test? Yeah, mate, it's... Um, I mean, the cap, cap presentation is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful ceremony now that I think... Uh, I'd never heard of it or seen of it before getting into the test team. But now I see it at, at every level of cricket, just about. Uh, I see it at you know, junior cricket, district cricket, school, first 11 cricket. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful tradition that's now built up to add um, extra value and meaning to the significance of being selected into, into a starting 11 at whatever level of cricket it is. Uh, a bloke, gentleman by the name of Bill Brown presented me with my cap, late Bill Brown. He was a member of the, amongst other successful Australian teams, he was a member of the 1948 Invincibles that uh, Sir Donald Bradman captained. So Bill was just a beautiful man, lovely, lovely guy, uh, opening batsman, um, really gentle spirit, but just spoke very, very proudly about the, the group of uh, men that, you join that had been before you and of course the many that will come after you and uh, that's in joining the men's test team so uh, it was really nice um, 
it was a really nice bond that you form with, with that person. I, I found I've kept in touch with Bill uh, up until his passing a few years ago. But uh, yeah, that was a really significant moment. And I guess, um, at, I mean, it's hard to, hard to sort of reflect on at the age of 16, 17 or 18. But by that stage, I was, I was a late starter in test cricket relatively about 28 um it, it just all the memories of all the sacrifice and commitment that you'd made to get there and also more the sacrifice and commitment that your family had made and your friends uh in helping support you to get to that point so um that's what i remember there and yeah it's just uh just a moment to to really enjoy fortunately we fielded first so i got straight out into the action with the weird keeping gloves on um Got a catch on the first day, so that was good. Easing my way into it, and then uh, and then I was off and running, which was, um, you know, it was everything I ever had ever dreamt of what it might be like. It was that plus more. Yeah, that's um, that's amazing, Adam. Particularly that eight year period from eighteen to twenty eight. That's ten years of sacrifice, turmoil, um, you know, and hurdles to overcome to get there. So, um, on to your second test. We're not going to talk through all ninety six. You know what I mean? I, I, you're a busy man. Um, but your yeah, second one. Uh, one of your, your more special. Um, we spoke to Justin Langer last week, who you're down Pakistan, Hobart. You know, I mean, I think the boys are probably caught up by YouTube on this. They were probably yeah. um, not born, but those listening around my age will remember it like it was yesterday. You, were, I think, you came in at five for one twenty-six in the in the fourth innings, um, chasing three seventy, and you and Justin Langer pretty much got him over the line. That must be a really special memory for you. Can you tell us how that transpired? Second test as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what I remember is that I mentioned about Bill Brown presenting me with my cap and that bond that you form. We're fortunate that um, that first test was up in Brisbane and the second test down in Hobart, uh, the one you made reference to, Luke. And um, we, we had Bill and three other members of that 48 Invincibles team come with us and, and sort of basically on tour with us down there. So we were... Um, it, that, that just created a really nice aura around the team. Um, I think we were all really respectful and mindful of those guys and that just added a new, a, a nice touch uh, in and around that, that week down in Hobart. Um, but fair to say, we didn't play particularly well um, up until the, uh, being five for 136 in the second innings. Um, but I, I just went out there. I got knocked over in the first innings by a guy that, a lot of the youngers, youngsters probably won't know or even certainly won't remember, but may not even know his name. A guy by the name of Sucklane Mushtaq. He's a guy that pretty much introduced the doujra or the sort of the, the leg spinning off break, um, if you like, into world cricket. And we were just baffled. We had no idea what was going on. Uh, and I got out to him in the first inning, stumped. I just missed, didn't pick it, had no idea what he bowled to me. So I got, went, went out there in the second innings. It's funny, like you sort of, it's a bit like facing Murali from Sri Lanka. You feel like you're under 12s playing in men's A grade because you just feel like you're so out of your depth when you're facing a mystery spinner. And I, I still can't pick them out of the hand. So that, it's a pretty um, deflating feeling to walk out there thinking, I'm going to get embarrassed here. I'm going to get, not, not physically hurt or intimidated, but just, I'm going to look, look like a goose. Um, so... Second innings, I went in there and, yeah, we were probably in the un unwinnable position, but got out there. Not sure what Justin recounted about this, but he looked at me and, he, and his first words were just, you never know. You never, never know. And I sort of went, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> You've got to say something like that, don't you? You're not going to say, mate, we're gone for all money here. This is all over. Just have a swing. Um, but we had a period of time to get through till to stumps that night uh, and we, we, we made a plan pretty quickly just to try and whittle it down into, into little minor, um, minor goals. So he was on, I think he was on 10 run allotments and I was on 10 minute allotments or vice versa. I might've been on the runs, so, but we just tried to break that down. Just remind each other we've got two more minutes to go until we tick another one off and so on. So, you know, goal setting, 101, if you like, the most basic type. But so often, uh, that's what you've got to go back to in trying to you know, climb a mountain. It's one step at a time. So we got through till stumps that night. 
we were about halfway to the target we needed to be. And uh, it was only at dinner, we, we, we sort of started to talk about what if, just imagine, imagine if we pulled this off, but you didn't want to get too carried away in your mind. You didn't want to tempt fate. So uh, we got there the next day and just started doing the same thing again, just little, little allotments, little 10 minute uh, blocks, 10 run blocks. I reckon we might have got lucky. I'm not sure what Justin recounts of um, one particular delivery where Pakistan was celebrating wildly. They were sure they had JL caught behind. Um, it was a dirty big noise, I must admit, from the non-strikers end. But he stood there. Umpire said not out. Justin later said it was a squeaky handle in his bat. So, I don't know. About seven years later, he admitted he smashed it. But I, I must admit, I... I actually didn't know at the time whether he hit it or not. And I came down and asked him, he went, yeah, no, nah, nothing. So he convinced me. Um, but we, we got the win. Uh, I think, I think the, the uh, leadership of that team, Steve Waugh was an amazing leader. And he always, he always just seemed to exude confidence towards those around him. He always gave them belief that they could achieve anything. And I think Justin and I were particularly... Uh, we particularly benefited a lot from Steve with that sort of leadership and we responded to him well. So I think he instilled a lot of belief, but, uh, but we got there in the end and it was, um, yeah, one of the most memorable ones. You mentioned, Luke, it was my second test. I, I went into the match presentation after and um, again for the younger brigade, I'm not sure if they remember, but um, the late Tony Gregg used to do the, the um, used to be a great commentator, but he used to do the match presentations with man of the match and so on. And, Justin was man of the match, but they asked me to come in because it was a pretty unique run chase. And Tony said to me, he said, oh, Gilly, he said, you know, well batted. He said, if in your test career, he said, of all the test pitches you've played on, that wicket looked like it was a beauty. He said, how, how would you rate that in your test career as a, as a pitch? And I just stopped and I thought, hmm. and I don't know, I said, it's in my top two. <laughs> um, which he lost it and the, Joe, the cameraman, lost it. And I could even hear Richie Benno up in the commentary through the earpiece. Losing it, but uh, yeah, that was about the only response I had at that stage into my second second test match. But it was a memorable day. Yeah, oh, that's a great story, Matty. Yeah, so he went on to play ninety six tests for Australia, won the Ashes multiple times. But during the early parts of your career, the one achievement that eluded the mighty Australian cricket team was winning in India, a fate not achieved since sixty nine seventy. In two thousand and one, you were one one nil up and then lost two one. In 2005, you captained Australia in the absence of an injured Ricky Ponting and clinched the series after a convincing win the third test. Talk us through what playing cricket in India entails and how much winning this series meant to you. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that about, with, about me winning and punt or not. It's about the only thing I've done that, that he hasn't. So I'm still <laughs> claiming that. Uh, yeah, India's... Oh, what an amazing place. I, I'm not sure if uh, many people watching or listening have been there or had the experience, but if when when the world hopefully gets back to somewhere towards normality, take the chance to get over there. It's an amazing experience. It's much more than a cricket experience. It's a life experience. And I love it. Uh, it can make you feel as high as high and it can make you feel as low as low too. And that's just on the field, let alone off the field, that the emotional roller coaster is extraordinary, but it's... Um, it's well worth the journey. Uh, yeah, you're right, Matty. Um, about three generations of Australian cricketers tried to win in India in Test cricket and couldn't. Um, even our team was dominant all around the world, but we couldn't win there. And 2001 was an extraordinary series where we were you know, so close, but we were just just outplayed by um, primarily Harbhajan and Singh, a spinner who picked up, I think, 31 or 32 wickets in three tests. Uh, but Steve War, again, I mentioned the leadership in 2001. Uh, he realised from his experience going to India, it was more in the mind where Australian teams weren't allowing themselves to win. And in fact, not only were we sort of blocking ourselves, we were too, too readily whinging about everything too ready to blame a loss on an umpire or how hot it is or a dodgy pitch or dodgy food, whatever it was, we would find a reason to blame someone else for losing. And then we'd pretty quickly say, oh, 
wait till you come back to Australia, we'll smash you over there and think that that's, that's cool. But um, so he, he felt we needed to, to change our attitude and our approach. And he actually wrote a, a quote up on the board of our first meeting in 2001 that says, attitudes are contagious, is yours worth catching? And I know the word contagious is probably a bit, <laughs> a bit dicey to be throwing around in this uh, current environment, but I think you, you get the gist. You, attitudes are contagious, is yours worth catching? And I reckon that's a brilliant quote that you can ask yourself every single day that the moment you wake up, what, what's your attitude going to be? Uh, because how you think then is how you'll feel and that's how you how you'll act particularly in a group environment. And if you're acting in a negative manner, that's going to catch on and others will, will either follow suit or they're going to waste a bit of energy and time trying to correct you and, and change your point of view. So um, that was it. It was a no whinge tour, he said. We're not going to whinge on that tour. We had to be positive. If it wasn't positive, don't say it. And uh, it worked really well. We didn't get the result in the end. It was the best test series I played in, I think, between that and the 2005 Ashes. Um, the quality of cricket was amazing. But, um, but what we do, did do, we learnt so much from that 2001 tour. We then went to Sri Lanka about three years later and Ricky captain, and we used a lot of that knowledge and, and tactical um, adaptation that we needed to make and carried that info into 2004. And although Ricky wasn't captain, he played a huge part in what we implemented tactically. Uh, I just had to try and steer the ship. And, but really, I think the, the, the beginnings of finally being able to win there started in 2001 with our attitude. And just, as I say, just asking ourselves every day, is it right? And if it's not, find a way to get it right or talk to someone about it. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. So one of your most memorable innings would have been your 100 against England here in Perth. Can you describe to the boys listening, some might be cricketers, some not, what it feels like to be in the zone when batting, but at the same time knowing that one little mistake can bring your innings to an end? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that, that, that innings uh, for me was probably what reminded me of why I started playing the game. And yeah, you're right, Scully, not every... Not everyone watching or listening is probably into their cricket or even sport. It might be music or theatre or the arts or whatever, you know, painting. Whatever it is, there's a reason why you start doing something. And that's usually because you enjoy it. And then you might become a bit passionate about it and really want to commit to it and, and give it a lot of time and thought and energy. That innings um, reminded me of why I started playing cricket. Uh, I'd, I'd got a little bit bogged down prior to that. And I, I sort of had a, a tough series about 18 months before in England and against Andrew Flintoff, who was you know, the main player at that point in time for England. He, every time he bowled, he'd get me out. Every time I went out to bat, they'd bring him on, he'd get me out. But, so um, I was sort of down in the dumps a bit and I, I probably let my attitude sort of slowly decline in general. Um, and I was starting to let my results affect my mood and the person I was. And that's not why I played cricket, but I managed to get out there in that innings, managed to somehow find the middle of the bat and it just freed everything up. And it reminded me, as I say, just what, what the reason I played for. And that was the, the fun, the, the love of the game, the, the feeling of, as you say, being in the zone and just, just, Deciding to try and hit a shot, you know, up in the air, over the top, and just for a split second when you got that ball right in the middle of the bat, and and you and only you know in the whole world that you've absolutely smoked it. You've got it right out of the middle. That's the best feeling, and you know it doesn't work sometimes. Doesn't work a lot of the times, but Jesus, when it when it does, it is just one of cricket's great feelings. And I think you can relay that into any other occupation or sport or interest, uh, whatever it is, just it's a nice reminder of why you did it. And even at the highest level, there's got to be a reason why you're doing it. And that reminded me of it. So that's probably the best way I can describe that. It was, um, I, prior to the innings, I was sort of talking myself into retirement almost. And by the end of it, I thought, hang on, no, 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 I've still got more to, more to do here. And there's more to, 
more reason to be playing rather than just sulking about the duck that I got in the first innings. Yeah, that's good innings. Uh, while we mainly focused on test cricket, you were part of three successive World Cups, 99, 2003 and 2007. What would be your favourite match or memory from these campaigns? Yeah, three World Cups, that's pretty... Um, I think that's... I think the, the victory in, in India in 2004 in Test Cricket was, I think, our greatest achievement as a Test team. But to get three, uh, three World Cups in a row, that's, I think it's going to be, um, take a bit of beating. So my memory of World Cup cricket is all those, get all those uh, World Cups. There's probably not one. We had a semi-final in, um, in 1999 against South Africa, which was quite possibly the best one day international game that I played in um, where we, we had a tie and we came, absolutely came from nowhere to, to burgle that one. Uh, but uh, 2003, I guess we, we lost our biggest player, our biggest name player on the eve of the World Cup. Shane Warne was found to have taken an illegal substance. So he was rubbed out for the whole tournament and for another year after that. Um, so that was pretty big news. So that was good leadership from Ricky Ponting and John Buchanan, our coach. They uh, made sure that we as a team sat down the night before the first game. It was before the rest of the world knew about what had happened with Warney. Uh, and we thoroughly went through it, talked about it, spoke openly and honestly about how we all felt. So that allowed us all to get it out of our system, if you like. And by the time we came back the next day to play the first game, whilst the rest of the cricket world was in total shock and all they could focus on was Shane Warne's um, suspension, we were able to focus on a game of cricket and kickstart our World Cup campaign. Uh, and then in 2007, I think we almost played the perfect tournament, really. Matthew Hayden just smashed everyone. I sat at the non-strikers end and just watched him belt them everywhere. And Glenn McGrath and Sean Tate just bowled brilliantly and won us a tournament. So... Yeah, I think there's no one particular favourite game. I think all three uh, experiences were different, but all bundled up. They're all very fond memories. Yeah, so the, um, the other side of being involved as a wicketkeeper is you get to watch front row seats to some of the best batsmen in the world. Have you ever... Were, or do you remember a time when you were there thinking, there is no way we're going to get this guy out? And who was that? Yeah, a few of those, James. But um, the three names that come to mind for me, two Indians, one West Indian. Um, the, I'll, I'll start with um, the West Indian, Brian Lara. Uh, he was, I think, well, the, between Brian and Sachin Tendulkar, they're both unbelievably classy players. But I suppose Brian was you just felt like you might be a, a chance of getting him out. He's probably going to hurt you a little bit more by the way of the risky talk and the stroke play. And I remember wicket keeping, I was standing up to the stumps in a one day game and a medium pacer was bowling and Brian was on strike and, and Ricky Ponting was captain. He brought his mid wicket across to backward point. So I won't bore everyone with cricket fine detail, but made a positional change in the field. And, and I heard Brian Lara, as he sort of took guard and leant over his bat, he murmured the word mistake. And I sort of pulled back, said, hang on, hang on, halves, don't bowl. And I, I just said to him, I said, what'd you say? He said, oh, no, that's a mistake. That field. And I said, come on, mate. Yeah, just concentrate on your batting. Let, let our captain, captain, you just watch the ball, all right? So Ian Harvey bowled, ran in bowled the ball, sort of outside off stump because he had a bit of protection over there now. And Lara went across the line, flicked it through mid-wicket, through the gap where the field had just come from. And I went, oh, okay, smart ass, right up. Bet you can't do that again. I'll, 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 there's a particular type of Cuban cigar that I knew that Brian liked. So I said, I'll bet you cigar you can't do that again. And he goes, oh, no, too easy. I said, no, no, I can't. So I sort of signalled to halves to almost bowl a wide outside off stump. Of course, he gets across there, flicks it through mid-wicket again. So this time I said, okay, here's a better challenge for you. If you're that good, try and get it past the two backward points that we've got, who are Ricky Ponting and Andrew Simons, the two best fielders, in certainly in the top five best fielders I ever played with or against. 
So Haas bowls another one, and, and, and but angles it at leg stump just to try to cramp him up. And he just guts away and just cut the ears off it straight between Ponting and Simons. So he was so skillful, so manipulative, and could, but, but you know, by the end of that over, we'd got him out because he's just too, he gets too engaged in the competitiveness and loves the risk. And whereas Tendulkar and the other Indian I mentioned, Rahul Dravid, just technically perfect um, and mentally perfect. Didn't get flustered by anything that was going on where you, you know, you could try talking to him, sort of sledging him a bit, a bit of gamesmanship, nothing. Go quiet, don't say a word to them, nothing. Just They just would lock in for the contest. And uh, Sachin Tendulkar got out a couple of times in 2004 in Australia where he, he nicked it, just chased a couple of little wide ones, got out cheap, cheaply in the first two tests. And he said he's not going to play the cover drive anymore. He's just too, he'd been too um, ill-disciplined. So in Sydney, the first cover drive he played was when he was on 215. So that's a pretty good mindset, that. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you've um, been behind the stumps to some of the best international players. Let's talk about some of the uh, best Australian batsmen that you've played with. You've got the, the War Brothers, Ricky Ponting, Matt Hayden, Justin Langer, uh, Michael Clark. Um, now, I just want to ask a question about Ricky Ponting. Mm -hmm. What was it like watching him and what separated him from everyone else? Uh, yeah, Punter's a, he's a funny one. He's, a, he's about three years younger than me, but he's a, he's a guy that I always thought was a bit of a mentor of mine. Uh, I don't know how, which is a bit odd when someone younger than you is a mentor and he's never even been told that he's my mentor. So it's, uh, I think on a side note, I'm sure mentoring is a, a word that's thrown a lot around in senior years of school and programs and particularly in leadership programs, whether it's sporting captains or, uh, or school captains and prefects, if you like. But um, I think the best mentoring is when someone doesn't even know they're doing it. Uh, and it's not, not manufactured. And that's what Ricky certainly provided for me. But I think it was Ricky's genuine desire to improve every time he trained. Uh, his level of intensity in training was amazing, be it in the net, batting, um, fielding, his fielding drills and, and quality of practice there was just exceptional. And, you know, again, it's a bit like that contagious attitude we'd finish net training and then we'd go and do team fielding drills and then he'd stay on and do that bit extra. And then eventually, you know, Simo or Matthew Hayden or someone else just watches a bit, watch, uh, I might do a bit more myself actually. And it just becomes a, that contagious effect where others start going, I might just do a bit more myself. And um, yeah, just doing it at a high intensity and, and trying to improve all the time. So that, that was probably what made Ricky, um, such a standout. He um, he came in as a very very talented youngster, rose to the top pretty quickly. Uh, was a little bit reckless, a little bit loose off the field. I don't think he'd mind me saying, but um, he certainly had a couple of incidents that he could have gone either way. He could have carried on and been the bad boy of Australian cricket, or just worked it out, thought about it, listened to the good advice around him, and uh, and grew up and realised that the opportunities that he had and the talent that he had, it would be silly to waste it and throw it away. Yeah, yeah. Now, a couple more, Adam, we'll let you go. But one, um, uh, you know, 15 years ish with the Aussie cricket team, there would have been some net sessions or particularly some fast bowls. I know you mentioned Sean Tate before that you were just like, oh, I'm, I'm not up for this. They are absolutely yeah. wound up. Um, do you remember any? And for any great cricketers out there, there's always that one bowl that bowls off 20 yards in the nets. You know what I mean? That, that, um, 20, 18 yards, I reckon. Most of them. Who, 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 can't trust those bowlers. Who bowls off 18 yards in the Australian cricket team? <laughs> oh, Brett Lee was horrible. Brett Lee was nasty. But hey, I tell you, I reckon Langer must have mentioned Sean Tate. He did. We didn't ask him that question, actually. Yeah. I saw that the other day. Yeah. Uh, when. When you say that, a, a net session, horrible fast bowler. McGrath was awkward, horrible to face. 
to your confidence. He was never going to hurt you, but he'd just get you out. Left hand, I'd run in, nip it across me, just sneak. And that's great, Pidge. I'm trying to get my confidence up for a test match and you're knocking me over here. But um, Tatey, Sean Tate, well, we, I mean, he's nicknamed the wild thing for a reason, um, just charging in and we're on the 2005 Ashes Tour and he was steaming in and, and John Buchanan, our coach, and we, we weren't going well at the time and he really revved up the quicks and said, come on, let's, let's get the quality of practice right here. We need you guys firing in for our batsmen to be up there. And poor old Jay Hill was in there. <laughs> Tatey was firing with a brand new ball, Duke's ball over there in the, at Nottingham uh, at Trent Bridge and just stand and just bang the, the, the perfect beamer, purely by accident. But <laughs> Alfie just hits the deck, gets up, angry little man that he is, throws it back, ready to take him on. And then, you know, and then, you know, Tatey sort of, sorry, sorry, and then JL gob full and get back and give us your best sort of thing. So Tatey thinks, right, oh, well, hang on a minute, comes in and follows it up with the best bouncer I've ever seen. So like, it's right, the gloves right in front of it. It was just on for young and old, but um, frightening. And then I was actually next to go in. And it was at that point where I just, the simply said, oh, I think throwdowns today is all I need. I'm feeling pretty good. Just, said, just want to feel the middle of the bat. So that'll, I'll hold it there. But now, uh, Sean Tate and the Nets, frightening. Yeah, all good. Uh, Kato? Yeah, Adam, we talk a lot to the Hale boys about what it takes to be a, a good teammate. Um, one of the key messages uh, that you don't need, need to necessarily be the greatest player to be a great teammate. Um, reflecting on your career at various levels, can I ask what you would consider to be some of the key ingredients of, of being a good team man? Uh, yeah, I think just simply um, what, working out what you can do to make the team a better team, um, what you can contribute. And clearly, you know, 100, 100 off 80 balls is a pretty, or, you know, five or six wickets is a pretty decent contribution, but we all know the reality is that they're, they're few and far between those sort of milestones and, uh, and, and it's not that easy to just say, yeah, that's what I'm going to contribute. Um, on the days where you haven't contributed on the scorecard, it's vitally important to, to make sure that the, the mood and the attitude is, is right around the team. Your contribution to allowing others to, to, to be their best. So, um, you know, supporting throwdowns, fielding, whatever it may be, just allowing them to prepare as well as they can. Mark Taylor was my very first Australian captain on, a, on an Ashes tour way back in 1997. I was the last member picked. I was, um, you know, they took 17 players. I was the reserve wicketkeeper. So you, you take all your batsmen, you take your bowlers, you get your wicketkeeping. Oh, we need to spare one of those. So I knew that I wasn't going to be playing any of the big games. Um, I was there as Ian Healy's understudy. But Mark Taylor sat me down in a one-on-one -on -one meeting at the start and he, he gave me this list of, of things that he wanted me to do. You know, at training, I had to do this. And during games, he, he required me to this, this. And he thought that this would help. And, you know, an off-field, he wanted me to part of the social group to try and organise any little functions we might have. And anyway, I walked out. He, he'd given me responsibility. He'd given me, which with that comes accountability. You know, because if you're not picking up your responsibilities, you you, you're not accountable for what you're doing. Um, I also felt as, as important as Glenn McGrath or Shane Warne on that tour or Steve Waugh just because I had a, a role to play. So that's, that's where I think I learnt about team, teamwork and being part of a team. Michael Kaspervich is a name that a lot of youngsters probably may not know. A lot of our generation would know him, that he was 12th man a lot for Australia. He probably played 20 tests. But he was a bowler from Queensland. He was just the ultimate. Those tours of India, he was always doing up like newsletters, funny, hilarious newsletters and slipping them under your door and all those little extra bits and pieces that add, you know, you've got a skeleton of a team and then it's, it's the good team men and women that add the flesh to the skeleton. Um, so that, that's probably it about what you can do to contribute to your team being a better team. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, All righty. So, um, if you could go back to your fifteen-year-old self and say something, what what would that be? Uh, 
First thing I say is don't steal in the game of chess, young Adam, that you're playing with your dad when he goes to the toilet. Don't steal his queen. Because <laughs> when <laughs> the, 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 the pursuit of victory isn't as valuable as the three weeks of having your footy boots wrapped up in newspaper and put in the top shelf when he realised that you cheated and you didn't admit it. Um, so that's the first thing I'd tell myself. Second thing would be there's no such thing as normal. Um, there's people look, may look a little bit differently to what you all used to. You might see people try different tactics or speak differently or I don't know, have different theories or um, be interested in different things. Um, don't be hell bent that just what you think and what you're interested in is normal and they're abnormal. Um, and communicate, really. I think that's probably the key, key to everything is just communication and making sure that... Um, and I, I think I was always okay at that. I, I don't remember reflecting and thinking, gee, I, I should have spoken more or, but just have the confidence to, to talk in, a, in, in the right environment and, and, and feel comfortable doing so. Yeah, definitely. All righty, so we're gonna push on to a bit of a lighter note now. We're gonna talk about a, an Aussie classic, the, the meat pie. All right. Um, bit, of, bit of history behind it is uh, Tuesday's pie day here at Hale School. And um, so all the boarders, all the staff get pies. You yep. see them all have their, their own little way of eating them. Uh, some people taking the lid off, eating it with a spoon. Some people putting sauce in or just eating the lid and throwing the whole pie away. <laughs> um, so how does Chris eat his meat pie? That's what we want to know. Yeah, well, I, I reckon school age. So uh, you younger boys there or below in age. I think the old, my favourite old-fashioned way was just to grab the, the sauce bottle and jam it into the top and squeeze as hard as you could so you could just see the roof, the lid of it bloat up and get the sauce directly in there. Um, but as I've matured, I think it's more of a um, just a, a light drizzling across the top. I've, I've never been one to try and lift the lid off. Too messy, far too messy, far too much time wasted, chance of spillage. Um, you know, you just got to be clear, concise about what you want. And that's just a nice representation of the sauce in there. Because you don't want them too hot, though, do you? They've got to be at the temperature where you can just absolutely hammer it. You don't want to be fussing around and have it dripping down here. Yeah, that's great. Adam. Now, we'll wrap it up there. That's, you know, I really appreciate your time. Very generous. And there'll be, you know, in, I'd say pretty much every one of our kids will listen to this in, in a week or so's time dotted around the state in isolation and, and there's so much to learn from and, and learn, you know, in from, from your career and what you learned from cricket, just not what made you a good cricketer. So, um, you know, wishing you and your family all the best of health. Hopefully we can stay safe here in WA and get things back to normal and, uh, and get back out there playing some sports soon. Yeah. Th thanks, Luke. Thanks guys. I, I, what a last thing I'll say is just, um, what an extraordinary time. This is, you know, clearly the history. This is going to go down alongside all the great historical events of the world and it's going to be right alongside it. Um, so um, there's an opportunity here, I think, for us all, but particularly for the younger generation, just to learn about independence and about capability of being um, versatile and nimble and whatever it is that you pursue, if you, if you can really seize that opportunity, there's an opportunity, there is a great opportunity here to, to develop that and grow and, and learn many, many skills. You know, not just, you know, the education component is really important and that's going to be carried out uh, so well by all the schools and the, um, and the teachers and headmasters and mistresses. But there's a whole lot of skills that we'll be able to learn out of this, and particularly at your age group, you're going to be able to develop those skills and they'll be so valuable um, down the track. So um, all the best with it. And um, yeah, look forward to, to seeing the guys that I've seen playing cricket before out there again sometime soon and uh, next season. And um, yeah, take care. Thanks, Thank Adam. you. Really? Really? <laughs> all right.